Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for joining today's webinar uh, titled Addressing Education Challenges During COVID-19, hosted by JPAL's Post-Primary Education Initiative, or the PP Initiative, um, as part of JPAL's broader COVID dialogue series, which features insights from researchers and policymakers on how to respond with evidence to the COVID-19 pandemic's most critical policy questions. Um, my name is Priyanka Varma, and I'm the manager of JPAL's PPE initiative and moderator for today's session, and I'm very excited to welcome you all for today's uh, conversation. Um, we'll be featuring three PPE-funded studies covering research related to um, online learning, parental engagement, and girls' participation during COVID times and their impact on students' educational outcomes. Um, so I'd like to briefly introduce you to uh, my other presenters on today's call. Um, first, we have Noam Ingrist. He is co-founder and executive director of Young Love, an NGO based in Gaborone, Botswana, that scales evidence-based programs in health and education. Um, he'll be presenting insights from his PPE-funded project titled Increasing Student Learning Through a Phone-Based Program During COVID-19 in Botswana. Second, we have Oriana Bandiera, a JPAL affiliate and the Sir Anthony Atkinson Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She'll present generalizable findings from her PPE funded project, Do School Closures During an Epidemic Have Persistent Effects? Evidence from Sierra Leone in the Time of Ebola. And finally, we have Michaela Carlana. Uh, she's a JPAL affiliate and Assistant Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She'll present insights from her PPE-funded study titled Tutoring Online Project During the Coronavirus Emergency in Italy. So we're very much looking forward to this exciting lineup of presenters today. Um, in terms of today's agenda, so um, I'll go ahead and kick things off with some brief opening remarks, and then I'll turn it over to Michaela uh, to discuss her online tutoring study in Italy during COVID times. Um, Noam will then present on his phone-based parental engagement study during COVID-19. Um, in Botswana. And then finally, we'll turn it over to Oriana for to present on her safe spaces for girls during the Ebola crisis study. Um, and then finally, we'll leave space for a, a Q&A discussion at the end of today's conversation. Uh, one quick note on the Q&A discussion is that um, instead of answering questions during the presentations or immediately after them, we'll save all of our questions for the Q&A discussion at the end. So feel free to take advantage of Zoom's webinar feature to submit any questions to us throughout the throughout their presentations, and then we'll kind of um, try to cover as many of them as possible during the Q and A session. So I will go ahead and kick things off, um, starting with a very quick introduction to JPAL. As we know, uh, the global community has been tackling widespread poverty for many decades, and yet billions of people still struggle to make ends meet. Um, and millions more remain in extreme poverty. To help respond to this pressing issue, um, governments, NGOs, et cetera, have been trying to tackle poverty for centuries. Um, and yet we see that many programs and policies are not effective enough, or they have unintended impacts that just aren't measured. Um, and this is kind of where JPAL comes in. So JPAL is a global research center that's headquartered within MIT's economics department um, that has seven regional offices around the world. And JPAL's mission is to reduce poverty by ensuring that policy is informed by scientific evidence and that research is translated into action. And we do this by innovating, by testing, by scaling up effective and cost-effective solutions for reducing poverty. And at the heart of this approach is our use of randomized evaluations, also known as randomized control trials or RCTs. Um, and as many of us know, randomized evaluations are the most rigorous form of impact evaluations. At JPAL, we work with a network of more than 200 of the world's foremost development economics who are united in their use of randomized evaluations to generate evidence on effective approaches to reduce poverty. Um, and we can see here on the screen some of the different um, uh, universities that our affiliates are connected to around the world. Our network of affiliated researchers have now carried out more than 1,000 randomized evaluations in 88 countries around the world. Um, and that research falls into the 10 sectors that you see listed on the right hand side of the screen. So for today's presentation, we'll focus on evidence specifically from the education sector. Something that I would really like to um, kind of emphasize is that JPAL's local grounding is really what's critical to the success of our work. 
Um, so as briefly mentioned earlier, we have seven regional offices, and then we have many more satellite offices around the world. Um, and our teams in these offices understand local issues, they understand local contexts, they know local languages, and they form close relationships with partners like government agencies, advocacy organizations, NGOs, to kind of help map evidence to the priorities of these partners. So to ultimately build up this culture of evidence-informed policymaking in these places around the world. So what does this actually look like? How does this work? Um, well, at JPAL, as mentioned earlier, we conduct randomized evaluations to evaluate programs and policies that seek to reduce poverty in low and middle income countries. From there, we seek to disseminate this evidence on what works and what doesn't work through policy outreach with policymakers, practitioners, and donors. And we complement this outreach with targeted capacity building so that these key stakeholders can better understand and use the evidence, ultimately leading to more evidence-informed decisions moving forward. And over the past 15 years, more than 400 million people have been reached by the scale up of evidence based programs that have been tested and found to be effective by JPAL affiliated professors. So now that we have this kind of general overview of JPAL and, and what we do and the type of work that we focus on, um, I'll briefly introduce you to JPAL's education sector. Education is one of JPAL's largest sectors with over 250 ongoing and completed education evaluations in 44 countries around the world. Um, here on the screen, you can kind of see a quick snapshot of the key lessons that we found from across these 250 plus evaluations. So I won't go over all of these at this time, um, but I'll just flash these lessons on the screen for you all uh, so you can get a quick sense of the range of topics we cover um, in case any of these topics are of interest to you and your organization or your institution. And you'll see that we kind of organize these lessons into ways that um, increase participation in school and then methods that Im improve learning in school. Um, and then we further break them down into topics like health and nutrition, um, information programs, inputs, education technology, um, et cetera. And so if you're interested in learning more about this evidence, I'd, I'd certainly encourage you to visit our website, um, which includes policy insights and blog posts related to these topics. Um, or you're welcome to reach out to us directly after today's presentation, and, and we'd be very happy to share more. So I'd now like to introduce um, JPAL's post-primary education initiative, or the PPE initiative. Uh, when we look across the global evidence in education, um, especially kind of several years ago, a major theme that emerged was that there's been a lot of great evidence in primary education, but often a dearth in evidence on what works and kind of what doesn't work when it comes to secondary, tertiary, and vocational and entrepreneurial education. And so meeting these challenges has required testing um, new and existing programs and policies to ultimately understand how best can we better reach post-primary students around the world. Um, and so in response to this growing global demand for more rigorous evidence in post-primary education, um, about eight years ago in 2013, JPAL launched the Post-Primary Education Initiative or the PP Initiative, which is a global education research fund. Um, and on the screen, you can see some of the donors who have uh, supported our work. Um, and over the past um, eight years, the PP Initiative has funded randomized evaluations that have been um, developed, that have developed and tested innovative solutions for improving access, quality, equity, um, of secondary, tertiary, and vocational education in low and middle income countries. Um, the PP initiative um, has become the world's leading vehicle for generating rigorous education evidence. Uh, to date, PP has allocated about $11.5 million in funding for about 99 research projects in 31 countries. Um, and in doing so, PP has helped close key evidence gaps related to topics ranging from curriculum to pedagogy, um, from education technology to governance. PPE's nimble structure has also allowed JPAL to respond to really um, immediate policy priorities. I think especially notably over the past year, PPE has already funded three research cycles in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and in particular, research coming out of this, uh, these funding rounds have really has focused on helping address key questions on how best to mitigate learning loss as a result of school closures and how to continue to motivate student learning both during and after the COVID-19 crisis. PP has funded research related to critical topics like girls' education, uh, remote and distance learning, and remedial education, 
Um, and today we're really fortunate that on our webinar we'll feature three PPE initiative funded studies that were um, funded either before or after these or before or during these COVID rounds with lessons that are relevant um, to education policy priorities during the COVID-19 crisis. So where does this all leave us and what's next for the PPE initiative? Um, well, the PPE initiative has officially come to a close after funding about 15 funding rounds over the past eight years. Um, and during this time, the PPE initiative um, has, the, because with PPE funded support, the number of post-primary education studies focused on teachers and pedagogy have increased about one and a half times and six and a half times respectively. Um, as a result of the PPE initiative, the number of vocational and entrepreneurial education studies has risen from one to 20 studies. Um, and new post-primary education studies on topics like curriculum, governance, and student motivation and effort have since emerged. And so the JPAL team is now exploring kind of the next phase of the PP initiative, which notably includes the expansion into a broader learning for all initiative, which will focus on research across all age and grade levels around themes of foundational learning and equity, um, which are particularly important for today's education context. So please definitely stay tuned for updates on our PPE website. Um, and of course, feel free to reach out to us if you're interested in learning more about our, our plans as they develop. So um, now in terms of today's panel, um, just some quick background. As we know, um, the ongoing COVID-19 crisis is likely going to exacerbate uh, the global education crisis. Um, in terms of school participation, school closures have left 85% of the world's student population out of school. Um, and girls and other vulnerable populations are at particularly high risk of returning to school, um, of not returning to school as schools slowly start to reopen. In terms of student learning, um, the share of children below minimum proficiency levels is expected to increase by about 25%, um, with differential access to remote learning and home conditions widening learning gaps for the most disadvantaged children and youth. There's also a growing, broader growing global need for rigorous evidence on effective and cost-effective programs and policies to support students during these times of crisis, particularly as they relate to remote and online learning, um, girls' education, and um, parental engagement. So that kind of leads to my next slide on um, our presentations for today. Um, Michaela Carlana, Noam Ingress, and Oriana Bandiera will present on their three PP funded studies, which cover all of these topics. Um, Michaela specifically will uh, present on online learning and student outcomes during the COVID-19 pandemic in Italy. Um, Noam will present on limit, limiting learning loss during using low tech in Botswana during the pandemic. Um, and Oriana will present on girls schooling and pregnancy during the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone, which has implications for the COVID pandemic. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Michaela, our first presenter of the day. Um, Michaela is a JPAL affiliate and assistant professor of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and she'll present on her PP initiative funded study, tutoring online project during the coronavirus emergency in Italy. So Michaela, over to you. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to present uh, our work. Uh, this is a joint uh, project with Eliana La Ferrara at Bocconi University. Next. Um, so school closure has led to substantial learning losses, uh, as Priyanka was saying before, uh, for children, but also strong adverse psychological effects um, for children that were forced to stay at, school, uh, at home during this uh, uh, time. The immediate reaction from uh, uh, several government, government around the world was to provide remote instruction to try to mitigate learning losses. But there is a high variation even within countries, not only across country, in what was provided to children, with children from low socioeconomic status being like often exposed to less inputs during the, uh, the time of school uh, closure. This has the potential of exacerbating existing inequality that we may have between the low and high socioeconomic uh, status children. Uh, next. So in this paper, in this work that was funded by PPE, uh, what we do is to evaluate a novel policy experiment that we launched in Italy in the middle of the first lockdown uh, due to the coronavirus. The project is called the Tutoring Online Project, and it's a randomized control trial in which we exploit over subscri a subscription to this uh, uh, program in order to understand the impact of exposure to online tutoring on the student outcomes. 
uh, thinking not only uh, on their academic outcomes, but more broadly also on their psychological well-being, uh, their aspiration, and their social-emotional skills. So the target of this intervention are students in grades six to eight from disadvantaged background. Um, disadvantaged background defined in terms of like socioeconomic status, but also language barriers and uh, learning difficulties. We know from uh, meta-analysis that uh, has been done by uh, several economists that in-person tutoring is one of the most highly effective uh, intervention in order to uh, mitigate learning gaps. However, what we test with this intervention in particular has two key defining features. So first, this online, uh, this uh, tutoring that we test is, uh, um, happens completely online. This is very important during a pandemic uh, when in-person interaction are not possible due, due to the lockdown, but also uh, thinking more broadly and, and thinking uh, to the next stage uh, after the uh, pandemic, this is also important to try to reach those children that are in disadvantaged areas and they don't have like high quality tutors that are located like close to them. The second key defining uh, feature of this program is that our tutors are volunteer university students that are trained and supported by pedagogical experts. So this allows us to uh, address one of the key issues of in-person uh, tutoring that is the high cost, um, usually like hiring like a professional. Um, the, um, through this like recruit recruitment method, we have like a low cost intervention, but also we have a high quality of the interpersonal, interpersonal relationship between the tutor and the tutee. The volunteer university students tend to have high intrinsic motivation and tend to build like a close relationship between the tutor and the tutee. So we will build on these two features uh, to understand whether these uh, could be an alternative method to deliver uh, tutoring in a cost-effective uh, way. Next. So the program that we implement uh, included like three to six hours of support done um, every week um, and the students were provided support in doing homework that were assigned uh, by their own uh, teachers, mainly in three subjects, math, Italian uh, and English. There was no extra need uh, from the tutor side to prepare materials, but they were support, su supposed to support the teachers in what uh, was already provided as part of the standard school curriculum. Uh, although there are three subjects covered in the tutoring, like the great majority of the tutoring session focus on math, and indeed at least 78% of students uh, cover math among the key uh, subjects of the tutoring. Next. So let me give you a brief overview of the program timeline and description. So in Italy, uh, it was one of the first country that was uh, after China that was uh, hardly hit by the pandemic and school closed on March 5th. We started a few weeks after with uh, the recruitment of school uh, and as a research team, we actually sent an email to all um, public Italian middle school um, in order to understand whether there was a, a request from their side of this uh, type of support. We asked the school to select up to three children uh, per class that needed the program the most in terms of like their le learning level and family environment that uh, could not be uh, providing enough support during the time of online learning. Uh, we verified, uh, we asked the school to verify they had like a, a internet access and the parent agreed to participate in the program. Um, and we asked them to indicate the subject, the main subject of the tutoring between um, the three uh, subjects that uh, we were covering, math, Italian and English. Uh, next. So on April 3rd, we started the recruitment of top tutors. And the recruitment happened through a simple email that was sent by the Dean of three big universities in Milan um, uh, 
uh, one of the biggest city uh, in Italy, uh, Bocconi uh, and the Free University are Bocconi in Bicocca and the State University uh, of Milan to older enrolled students. And we asked these uh, university students to volunteer in one of or more uh, subjects. And we informed them that they would have been supported by a pedagogical a team of pedagogical experts uh, that was providing a self-training uh, course, but also uh, some individual and group counseling in case they were dealing with difficult uh, cases. This was particularly important, especially for children where we were learning difficulties. Next. Um, by April 15, um, we uh, concluded the baseline survey that was collected by all parents and uh, students that uh, um, uh, were entering into the randomization for this uh, project. We had more than 1,000 uh, completed application from uh, families. However, due to budget and administrative capacity, we could uh, only support like uh, with our team of pedagogical expert and limited number of tutors, we randomized uh, the students that were offered the uh, online tutoring uh, during this uh, time. Tutors were randomly uh, assigned. So we had like actually more than 2000 uh, applications from tutors themselves. And what we did is also a randomization on the tutor side, uh, conditional on certain characteristics, for example, the availability in the subject and the time slot and experience, we randomized whether a tutor was offered uh, the possibility to be a tutor uh, within uh, our project and was assigned uh, to a student. After um, uh, around like uh, mid-April, we started with the intervention that went on until uh, the end of uh, May. Next. So the, at the end of the day, we have uh, 76 schools that cover like uh, um, uh, schools in all over Italy with a higher concentration in the north of the country. Um, and we have more than 500 uh, volunteer university students that were selected, as I said, uh, from a pool of uh, around 2000 applicants. Next. So uh, in June, we started, we collected the endline questionnaire. The questionnaire was collected online to parents, students, and their teachers of both the treatment and control group. We collected in particular a supervised test score that included the question in all uh, three subjects that were part of the tutoring, but also beliefs um, from the student tutor, uh, tutors, uh, parents and teachers in terms of like the ability of the children and especially the grades that were assigned by uh, the teachers. Um, on top of that, we had three batteries of questions, one on aspiration, one on social emotional skills, and the first third battery that was on well-being, including like a child depression screener and a happiness scale. I will show you now uh, the main result for this intervention, which includes the uh, performance in the standardized test score and the some index that uh, uh, put together all the questions on these three blocks on the aspiration, social emotional skills, and well-being. Next. So here you have the main result of our intervention. First, in the first column, you see that um, the performance of students that were assigned to a treated uh, to a tutor compared to those that applied but were not assigned to a, tu uh, to a tutor increased in the um, standardized test score of 0 0.26 standard deviation. Uh, this is a pretty substantial increase compared to like most uh, uh, intervention and is not that far off compared to uh, the average from the meta-analysis in terms of like the in-person tutoring. In the other three columns in this graph, you see the um, impact in terms of standardized index on the other three key dimension uh, that we collected that are the aspiration, social emotional index and well-being. And overall, we find like positive uh, um, a point estimate in all these uh, uh, dimensions. And this was particularly important, for example, if you think about the well-being, uh, children, uh, especially uh, children from low socioeconomic uh, background, are often staying like in a small house and having like limited interaction outside the house, maybe reasonably uh, increase their, uh, their well-being, their possibility uh, to have someone to interact with that is uh, um, 
providing also like some uh, aspirational uh, intervention as these university students are uh, in most of the cases like the first connection that these uh, middle school children have with someone that actually is attending a uh, university. Next. So finally, as I said, we collect several other outcomes, but just for brevity, let me just focus on the last column in this table where we have the results in terms of the teacher assigned grade. And also from the teacher assigned grade, we find very similar results compared to what we find in the standardized test score with an increase of 0.18 standard deviation in terms of uh, the performance of children in the treatment group compared to um, children in the control group. Next. Finally, uh, a key point that is particularly relevant for potential scale up uh, also in low income setting is the which technology is actually used during the tutoring. We tried uh, to, in, uh, um, to push schools to help children to get access to internet and get a device available. However, uh, despite that, like still 20% of the students used only the smartphone in order to uh, do their entire tutoring. What we find from the endline results is actually that the fact for those children that did the tutoring with uh, the computer or tablet compared to those children that did the tutoring with the smartphone is not that different. You see, for example, in the first column that those that did uh, the intervention with the, uh, the phone had like a slightly more negative impact, but it was not statistically different compared to other children uh, in our uh, group. Next. We also find analyze several um, heterogeneity in terms of like student and tutor characteristics, and we find that overall limited uh, heterogeneity, um, except for a couple of key aspects. Let me just focus on one. Um, in particular, immigrant students were those that were struggling the most in terms of like their well-being, and these children are those that benefited the most from the interaction with uh, our tutors. This is particularly important when we think about the scaling up to other contexts that may be even more disadvantaged compared to uh, what uh, we have in the Italian context. Next. Finally, we are able to show uh, the effect on the tutor themselves. As I say, that we were able to randomize the tutor uh, that were as, uh, the, this university student that were assigned as a tutors conditional on some set of baseline characteristics, including like subject, the time availability and experience. And we collect the two uh, set of like outcome for the tutors. One is an index on their empathy. And the second one is a, a index on how much they believe on hard work. And what we find is an increase in the uh, empathy level uh, for tutors that were assigned uh, to be a tutor within our project. And this is a pretty substantial increase uh, in terms of like almost 0.3 standard deviation increase in their empathy uh, after being assigned to this uh, um, uh, tutoring intervention. Next. Let me conclude. Um, so what we, uh, what I show you today uh, is uh, some uh, brief evidence from uh, our study um, that uh, online tutoring provided by volunteer university students can be a simple and cost-effective intervention in order to mitigate uh, inequalities in education. Um, the key advantage that are even like outside uh, COVID time is the possibility to easily reach remote location where university students are not uh, are not necessarily uh, located, um, and also the possibility to supply. Um, qualified tutors in, uh, from other regions uh, that, uh, um, that may allow an exposure to a different uh, environment, for example, an exposure to, univer to university students, to people that do not have much of such uh, exposure. The last advantage is the low cost uh, due to the volunteer uh, nature, uh, nature of our tutoring uh, intervention. 
On the opposite side, we may have some potential limitation, including like internet access and technology. And indeed, right now we are um, planning a scale up of this intervention in the Dominican Republic with a pilot uh, ongoing together with uh, Acedu Pineda, um, in which we are trying to test whether like uh, this type of intervention could be effective uh, also in other countries. And more broadly, we are scaling it up at uh, uh, reaching like more, more students every year in the 2020, 2021, we reached eight, uh, 800 treated students in Italy, and we are planning to reach 2,500 students from next academic year. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, maybe next, thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Michaela, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to our colleague, Noam Angrist. Um, Noam is co-founder and executive director of Young Love, who will present insights from his PP initiative funded project titled Increasing Student Learning Through a Phone-Based Program During COVID-19 in Botswana. Noam, over to you. Sure, hi everyone. Um, I'm looking forward to presenting this today and, and a big thanks to JPAL PPE for, for um, making this possible, both in terms of the trial as well as sharing these results. I'm going to be presenting this paper, Schools Out, Experimental Evidence on Limiting Learning Loss Using Low Tech in the Pandemic. This is with co-authors Peter Bergman at Columbia uh, and Moitepi Machang, co-founder of Young Lab, and also the chairperson of the Government of Botswana's National Youth Council. Uh, next, please. So as we all know, it's been quite a historic crisis, not just in health, but also in education. Uh, over 1 billion children out of school at the height of the pandemic. And what you can see here is a map from UNESCO uh, showing countrywide or localized school closures. And you can see it's pretty much all schools in the world. This was at a snapshot point in time, but as we know, this continued uh, over time. Uh, next, please. So the big question that we were thinking about was how do we provide education when schools out and closed? And we came to low tech uh, as a partial substitute for schooling. And when we were uh, thinking about low tech, we were thinking about feature mobile phones uh, because they're high access and, and they're low cost. So what you can see here in this map from the Center of Global Development is whereas the teal is internet access, a kind of higher tech solution, uh, and it's just about 60% access, uh, households have access in upper middle income countries and below 20% in low income. But in contrast, the pink there owning a mobile phone is 80% to 90% in almost all income categories. So if we want to reach people at scale and meet them where they are with devices they currently use, we felt mobile phones could be a, a really relevant approach. Next. So we launched a rapid trial and we enrolled 4,550 households in Botswana in distance learning. And you can see here a map, a heat map of households enrolled. Uh, Botswana is 80% desert, so this actually covers almost every single populated part of the country uh, and was actually nine out of 10 regions in the country. Um, so it wasn't a kind of niche or, or uh, elite subset, it was actually quite representative, rural, low literacy, uh, and so forth. Next. So what was the intervention? On the left hand side, you can see these were very simple SMS messages that went to households. And this was going to caregivers, which was either a parent or a sibling or a grandparent. Uh, at, who had kids who were in grades three through five and they were, they were sharing the phone and working with their child uh, in the household. So very simple problems here. You can see this is a simple place value problem. Uh, welcome to week two. Here are some problems you can try with your children. Uh, you can see there's kind of an example problem. Uh, here's 320 in words, 320 in numbers, and then it's a fill in the blank. Uh, so then they get the number 325, they fill it in and later it progresses to a word problem Kamaholo has 257 pula, how many hundreds, tens, and units? So this is a place value problem. We also had addition and subtraction, but you can see it's very simple. Uh, and it's it actually, a lot of effort went into cramming this into just 320 characters in the easiest to kind of engage with way, but still very concise. And then on the right-hand side is another treatment group which supplements these messages with a direct 20 minute phone call uh, by a teacher or facilitator who's walking through content, providing a little bit more content uh, and giving that extra boost. And then there's a cross-randomized intervention, which is actually targeting the instruction to the child's level, where we actually got data on whether the child knew addition or subtraction or multiplication. And then based on that would actually customize what they would get next. So if they got addition right, they would move on to subtraction and so forth. Uh, next. 
So this is the experimental design. We started with 7,550 phone numbers. We then called those numbers back to make sure they were working and they were the right people. Uh, this was 6,375 numbers that were working, so about 10% drop off, not huge, but, but something. Uh, and then 70% of those households said we want to participate in the trial, uh, so 4,550 was left. What was really interesting is this was actually not very selected. So we ran a bunch of tests and actually this 4,550 number, uh, very similar distribution in terms of learning to the national average, uh, very similar in terms of literacy level, ruralness. Uh, so it was kind of just arbitrary, this drop off and, and a bit more random. Uh, actually, this was pretty representative of the national averages. Uh, three core treatment groups, the control, the SMS, and the phone in the SMS. Then we actually called a random subset with a midline, and that was our first wave of data collection. Got data on kids' learning levels, cross-randomized targeted instruction, and then did a follow-up uh, a few months later. Next. Uh, so a bit of context, this didn't come out of a vacuum. It would be very hard to pull this off otherwise. Uh, before uh, we did this trial, we had already been very active in 20% of all primary schools in the country in Botswana. Uh, and we actually collected phone numbers right as school closed. So we had about three days uh, before schools closed. And our team, which was in schools throughout the country, said, who would like to share phone numbers and be enrolled in distance education? Uh, and amazingly, the response was just tremendous. And, and this was really surprising to us, actually, because you can imagine schools had so many things to prioritize in these three days, giving homework out, shutting schools down. Uh, it was right in the beginning of the pandemic. But people were so worried about how uh, their children would receive an education, uh, we actually got a huge uh, surge of interest and collected, as I said, thousands and thousands of numbers throughout the country. Uh, I, I think as Michaela alluded to, just the demand for these things was really high, oversubscribed uh, by far. Uh, and actually, interestingly, 80% of the numbers we got, we had never actually had any contact with. So the word spread throughout the nation and, and actually 80% of the numbers we'd never done programming with before. One conundrum we'd faced, I know many, many face this, is how do we get services to everyone? It's a humanitarian crisis, but also there's so much uncertainty and we have such limited budgets and we have to make choices. We can't just throw the kitchen sink at this. How do we get some evidence to inform those choices, but still provide this humanitarian service? We landed on the, the model of doing a very rapid randomized trial where we collect the data every month and a half uh, so that we could make decisions real time. And if it was working and very clearly uh, working, we would we would roll it out, and if it wasn't, we would we would keep pivoting and seeing what to do. So that was the balance that we struck. Uh, and finally, I would say it was critical that this was relevant to the government uh, approach and policy from the beginning. And the director of basic education actually said, "We've always been wondering if to do this actually, and asking teachers to make these calls. So if this shows it's cost effective, we'd love to pick it up as a, as a as a government." So um, all of these points were things we considered when we started. Next. So just a bit of context on Young Love. Uh, Young Love is the largest NGO in the country, one of the largest in the region, and our mission is to connect youth to proven life-saving information. All the programs we run are based in randomized trial evidence or impact evaluation. Uh, that's our starting point. Uh, and we're focused on health education and youth, and we're a close government partner. So in addition to Moitepi's role as the chair of the National Youth Council, we have an MOU with the government to uh, work in nearly all schools in the country and work hand in hand, in hand with the government on everything we do. Next. Uh, and prior to COVID, we were delivering uh, programming in schools, as I shared with this wonderful coalition, including JPAL, uh, UNICEF, USA, Government of Botswana, Prasam, Tel Africa, Brookings, uh, the whole gang. Uh, we were delivering teaching at the right level, which is another evidence-based program, which, which I imagine many are familiar with. I won't get into it, but that's the context for all of this. Next. So how did we measure our outcomes? This is another innovation uh, that was part of this, is actually measuring learning and measuring it via phone, which is a bit unconventional. Uh, so we started from the Aster assessment, which is, has been used in 14 countries and in the education literature. Uh, you can see here a very simple example, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We added into that place values and fractions. And we also measured things like parent perception, uh, their return to work when lockdown was eased, and so forth. Next. I'm cutting to the chase with the results. Here's what we see. Uh, the red is average level. This is from addition to, to division. Uh, and it's in terms of standard deviations, what I'm presenting here. And then we have also got place value in the green and fractions in the, in the blue. You can see the SMS on its own has positive effects, but this is actually not statistically significant. So it's not a game changer, but it's, it's slightly positive. 
Uh, phone calls and SMS, you can see, are quite effective and significant. So 0.12 standard deviation gains on average level, and this translates to place value and even fractions, which is interesting because fractions actually we didn't teach uh, in the intervention. So this is suggesting it's not just familiarity, but they're actually getting concepts in addition and division that enable them to do fractions, so kind of above and beyond learning. Uh, interesting, if you look at whether it was targeted or not, this was cross-randomized. Uh, the not targeted is pretty effective on average level, uh, but not translating to these other competencies like place value and fraction, uh, whereas targeted is similarly effective on average level, uh, but translates above and beyond to place value and fraction. So that kind of makes sense. It helps you really adjust and adapt real time. Uh, so some suggestive evidence there. Next. Uh, we, in terms of robustness of the learning outcomes, one of the things that we did is we actually randomized which problems uh, of the exact same proficiency. So here's an example from addition. Uh, you can see it's two by two with carryover. So 34 plus 47 in the black, 43 plus 29. These are all the same proficiency, just different numerals. Uh, and what we wanted to see here is, is it the same latent ability, no matter which kind of problem we give for the same proficiency? Again, we have this for all the questions. I'm giving one example here. And you can see that that's true, actually. So all the confidence intervals overlap here. About 15% of kids could do uh, addition. So that gives us some confidence that we're picking something up, no matter which question we were asking. It, it's a pretty reliable measure. Next. Uh, this is another robustness test. So one of the concerns with um, alert, these learning assessments is potentially an effort effect. Now, actually, effort is very important. So we wanted to see if, if effort was happening. And there's been other studies showing that, for example, if you offer to pay kids right before they take an exam, they suddenly do better. They obviously didn't learn anything in that. But second, uh, it's sort of a motivation effort. You can imagine this is even more the case potentially uh, for assessments that are happening in the household where it's not proctored and kind of this focus, focus effort effect could be at play. Uh, and so we, we actually had a riddle or kind of a real effort task what you can essentially see here uh, is for effort, for example, in the phone and SMS, you see a small uptick 0.02, but the p-value in brackets is not significant, 0.33. In contrast to learning average level, this is now not in terms of standard deviation, 0.15 increase in level, uh, very significant p-value, 0.008. So big cognitive skill gains, but not effort effects on the test. So this gives us some confidence we're picking up cognitive skills. Next. Uh, engagement, we see that this was high actually. So any engagement in the black there is 85% when we start, which is really, really high. And interestingly, even by week 10, actually, we're seeing over 60% continue to participate. So just to benchmark this, a lot of these remote interventions waver between 10 to 50%. So this is actually on the upper end of engagement. Uh, and so we were pretty happy with this. The other interesting thing you can see uh, is the type of engagement changes. We're actually seeing engagement more over time with the blue uptick increasing uh, relative to the gray, more than 10 minutes of content uh, relative to, to less. So that, that's kind of positive, more intensive engagement, even if it declines a little bit. The other thing that suggests is the treatment on the treated effects are going to be even larger than these intention to treat. Uh, next. Uh, parent mechanisms. So there's uh, some interesting work on whether parents and teachers actually know what their child knows. Do they know addition or subtraction? That's obviously critical for being able to support them. So we see in the gray here actually an uptick in parents being able to identify their child's level, especially in the treatment groups where there's big learning gains. So phone and SMS, for example, you can see a big significant uptick there. Uh, and even more actually in parents' level of confidence that they can support their child. And this is actually quite groundbreaking because a lot of these families uh, and households had never engaged in the education process with their children before. So this was, this was quite a big deal. Next. One concern potentially is that there could be crowd out. So as households and, and caregivers are engaging in education, is that crowding out other activities? For example, uh, did they not go back to work as a result? Is there sort of this displacement effect? We don't find evidence for that. So we actually, if you look at column two here, phone and SMS panel A, you can actually see there's a decrease in unemployment. So actually, it's, it, parents are going back to work actually as lockdown ease. Uh, this is not a huge effect. It's not a labor market intervention, but 2.9 percentage points, not trivial. Uh, and so we're, we're actually not too worried about this crowd out. Uh, and one of the interesting things we were hearing actually is parents felt really confident that their kid learned. They actually felt comfortable getting back to normal life. They were not so distraught about the, the education shock. Um, so, so still not sure exactly why, but we don't see this big crowd out. Next. 
So just wrapping up with some policy implications and some takeaways, I shared some results on effectiveness, but the cost effectiveness is actually particularly striking. So 0.89 standard deviation gains for $100. So that's on par with some of the most cost effective programs in the literature. Uh, another point was this, these results came out pretty early in the pandemic. Uh, where while there was a lot of evidence uh, activity happening on the health side with vaccines, really quite historic, uh, unfortunately, uh, it was more limited in education and uh, our partners who supported this work were really uh, kind of quick and nimble to help get some evidence out there. So this was one of the first RCT uh, trials uh, showing what can work for distance education. So got big uptick and big demand. Um, another point here is governments actually spent a lot of money on ICT, information communications technology, uh, but often it's spent on higher tech things like tablets or computers, and there the evidence is actually mixed. Uh, often it's a bit too hardware and inputs uh, uh, based, and so uh, it's, it's sort of not packaged fully with training and all of these other things. One idea is to spend it not just boosting those higher tech approaches, but actually trying some of these lower tech approaches where actually you don't need to give people gadgets because they have phones. And so you can really focus on the pedagogy and the teaching learning. Uh, another point here is it could be a potentially cheap way to target instruction. Teaching at the right level has been tried uh, in classroom-based models as well as computer-based software. This could be another cheap way, this individualized phone call. Uh, and it kind of related to the earlier presentation, another potentially cheap and scalable model for, for high dosage tutoring in low and middle income settings, which, which could work in, in those contexts. Uh, final two points here. One is this was a real eye opener for us, actually. Certainly this was a historic uh, school closure and unprecedented, but we actually realized schools do close in other settings. And this was just a problem we had not really thought about so much. So during teacher strikes, weather shocks, rainy season, uh, natural disasters, refugee settings, summer breaks. And in all of these settings, low-income households typically lose a lot of learning, and this could be a potential way to, to support in that, uh, as well as be actually a complement during normal schooling to support the lower performers or, or those who need extra support. And finally, this point on parents, uh, there's actually been uh, a lot of engagement with, with parents, but it's often focused on information like report cards. Uh, we think this trial is showing that actually parents can be quite involved in the direct uh, teaching learning process. And that, that's a really interesting thing to explore, especially in low literacy settings where parents are often not involved in education uh, informally. Uh, next. So last two slides here, I would just say it's been such an amazing uh, wild ride and a bit of hope uh, amid such a, a tough time. And there's been uh, so much um, difficulty with all of this, but uh, uh, kind of interesting to see the interest and the demand for this approach. So the Botswana trial, uh, we got results in, in late May and July. And from there, we actually got so much demand. We launched follow-on scale-ups and trials uh, in Kenya with New Globe, a large NGO, and in Nepal with the government of Nepal, uh, the World Bank Teach for All, uh, as well as Street Child, uh, and already actually those results are streaming in and it's looking very, very promising. And we've actually launched a series of other trials in India. Uh, we're in conversations with the IADB and IPA to, to launch more. Um, so in the last slide, I'm actually just gonna thank everyone who's been a part of this coalition next. Uh, and this will be the end. Um, so just an amazing research and implementation coalition. It's just remarkable how everyone has come together around this effort to, to provide distance education and a phenomenal set of funding partners who've made this possible. So big thank you. Uh, and we actually we're actively uh, seeking out more partners to, to join these replication efforts and test this uh, across contact. So if anyone's interested, I think the last slide is my email. Uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Noam, for these very insightful um, thoughts that you shared with us. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to our final presenter, um, Oriana Bandiera, j -Pal affiliate and the Sir Anthony Atkinson Professor of Economics at LSC. Um, she'll be presenting findings from her PPE funded project, Do School Closures During an Epidemic Have Persistent Effects? Evidence from Sierra Leone in the time of Ebola. And insights from her study during the Ebola context can have some really interesting implications for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so Oriana, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is, I should say, joint work with uh, Imran Rasul, uh, Marcus Goldstein, Andreas Moore, and Niklas Bern. They just didn't fit in your template. And this is the new uh, title of the new incarnation of the paper. Uh, why are we talking about Ebola when the, the session is about COVID? Well, one advantage of looking at Ebola is that it's long gone, thankfully. 
And so we can look at the long term consequences of an epidemic, which leads to severe school and uh, other facilities closures. Next, please. So the basic, you know, the starting point is that social distancing is needed to combat viral outbreaks. But at the same time, as we've been experiencing, this reduces the availability and restricts economic activity. Now, the true cost of politics depends on where the consequences outlive the viral outbreak. Uh, one key channel, which no surprisingly fits in this, is that diseases can have a much longer term impact than the period that they were in place for is by affecting investment in human capital. Now, obviously there is a short-term pause in human capital because schools are closed. Although the presentations that we've seen suggest that there are ways to keep things going. But the true issue is whether once the schools reopen, you can start from where you left off or whether you permanently shifted to a lower trajectory. Uh, next, please. Next. Sorry. Uh, sorry, there should be another one before. Okay, thank you. So we provide evidence on this one key channel, which we think might be a play in many other settings. And that channel is teenage pregnancy. Uh, we look at the causal chain from school closure, which basically makes girls more exposed or lowers their opportunity cost of time because school is closed, so there is not much else to do, and leads girls to spend time with men. Uh, this might lead to unprotected sex, which leads to pregnancy and childbirth. And fundamentally, once the girl has become a mother, it's very difficult to return to school because the cost of time has become very high having to take care of the child. Uh, in Sierra Leone, things were made worse by the rule that visibly pregnant girls were not allowed to attend school. So it's not just dropping out once the kid has been born, but actually once girls were pregnant, they weren't allowed to go to school at all. Uh, in Sierra Leone, is a good setting, sadly, to study these issues for a number of reasons. One uh, is a country that uh, scores among the lowest in the world for gender equality. Uh, so if you look at the, say, the UNDP Gender Equality Index, which uh, puts together pregnancies, violence against women, early marriages, and so on, Sierra Leone scores among the lowest in the world. So this is a context where girls are really vulnerable. The epidemic of Ebola was quite severe and it led to a lot of closures. All the schools were closed for a year. And fundamentally for our paper, most health centers were closed for a year. The reason why the health center matters for this channel is that the health centers in Sierra Leone provide safe spaces for the girls. They organize uh, clubs, they organize life skill training. And so having both school and health center closed means that there is nearly nowhere the girls can go. Uh, the second source of variation is the randomized rollout of BRAC uh, ELA program which is an empowerment, empowering life of adolescents, that's what ELA stands for, which offers, again, safe space and training. So what we have fundamentally is entirely by luck, because when we designed the evaluation of the ELA program, nobody knew that Ebola was gonna strike. Uh, we have variation in villages where the health center closed and variation in the allocation, this was done randomly, of the ELA program. Because the ELA program targets exactly the same outcomes 
that the Ebola can disrupt, that is pregnancies and human capital, we can adopt a two by two design where we look at the effect of health center closures, depending on whether the village has the ILA program or not, or vice versa, look at the effect of ILA, depending on whether the health center has been closed or not. Uh, the evaluation design, which was an evaluation design for the ILA program, was a village level randomization, over 200 villages, some of which got the program and some of which didn't. And the sample that we look at for this paper are 3,000 girls aged between the ages of 12 and 18. The reason we look at this young cohort of girls is because we are particularly interested in knowing whether the epidemic led to pregnancy, which led to dropout. Older girls are typically not in school. Next, please. So as I was saying, the timing of uh, our study is entirely fortuitous because we completed the baseline days before the start of the epidemic in Sierra Leone. Um, and as I already mentioned, we cannot claim that we organize this evaluation so to study the effect of ILA on, uh, um, on the Ebola, on the reaction to Ebola, but rather the ILA targets the two main outcomes in the causal chain, which are pregnancies and dropouts. We adapted the design of the evaluation to the pandemic in the sense that during the epidemic, we ran a phone surveys, both with the village to uh, the effect of social distancing in the villages. So that's where we get the information about the health center closures. We call them regularly to ask whether the health center was open or closed. And we also surveyed the leaders of the clubs. The way the clubs work is that they appoint a local girl who gets trained by BRAC to run the club. And this girl runs the life skill training, which is information about contraception and relationship with men. And then she organizes a vocational training program with BRAC. And the vocational training programs are run by professional trainers. Next slide, please. So to start with, we look at the impact of Ebola in controlled villages. Okay? Now, of course, we can't isolate the impact of Ebola from other things that were going on at the same time, but I think it's reasonable to think that Ebola was the main thing that happened between 2014 and 2016. So the first panel here on the top left corner looks at enrollment at every age, enrollment in school. The blue lines are 2014 before the epidemic and the red lines are in 2016 after the epidemic. And you see that at every point in time, that is at every age, girls are less likely to be enrolled in school after the Ebola epidemic. The panel next to it on the top right uh, lists the main reasons that girls gave for dropping out of school. And again, the blue lines are the reasons given before the pandemic, and the red lines are the ones given after. And you see that before, financial cost was the key reason for why girls stopped going to school. But afterwards, pregnancy took over. And indeed, if you compare girls who did get pregnant during the epidemic to those who didn't, you see that 85% of girls who get pregnant do not return to school. So it's nearly impossible, observationally at least, to go back to school if you become to go pregnant in the meantime. Vice versa, 73% of those who did not get pregnant went back to school. So again, this is not randomized, but the numbers are pretty clear that there must be a relationship between pregnancy and dropout. What we're going to do next is to assess whether the availability of clubs, which increase the opportunity cost of time, or in other words, give girls something to do uh, in the absence of schools, break this link. So 
we see whether the clubs break the link and then once the link is broken, whether girls are more likely to go back to school. Next, please. So this uh, rather ugly table shows that in control villages where the health center closed, that's where Ebola created the biggest effects on pregnancies. In our questionnaires, we introduce a very detailed time use module. And this time use module allows us to measure exactly what girls do. And so you see here that in villages where the health center closed, there was a reduction in the time devoted to learning and an increase in the time socializing. And in particular, an increase in the time socializing with men. And this is explicitly asking about men with whom they have sexual relationships. Correspondingly, there was a drop in school attendance and an increase in the frequency of unprotected sex and an increase 12 percentage point increase in pregnancy rates. So this is what happens in the control villages with Ebola when the health center closes. Next, please. Now, in villages where the health center closes, the demand for the ELA club is much higher. In particular, you can see the stuff that highlighted in red, 64% of eligible girls attend where the health center is open. And that number goes up to 76% where the health center is closed. More interestingly, perhaps, the ability of the girls to attend changes in the two villages. That is, in a health center closed, um, in villages where the health center closed, we see that the share of high ability girls attending is much higher than in villages where the health center is open. And this suggests that these are the girls who have the strongest demand for uh, attending school. Next, please. So in these villages, that is where the health center is closed, the allocation of the ELA program basically undoes the effect of health center closures. So what all these uh, bars mean in all these graphs, the gray bar represents the effect of uh, health center closures, and the green bar represents the effect of ELA. So for instance, if you look at this graph, you see that the proportion of girls who go to school collapses, but this is compensated by the presence of the ELA club. We have a measure of skill, self-reported measure of mathematical and literacy skills, and maybe that's the easiest thing to see here, the skill index. We have a massive drop in villages where the health center closes, but this is undone by the existence of the ELA club. We find the same pattern for pregnancy, which is down here. You see there is an increase, the gray bar is positive, but that's completely undone by the presence of the ELA club. Next, please. Um, we measure, we go back um, three years later in 2019, and we see whether these effects are persistent. That is, whether the girls who were induced by the program not to get pregnant are more likely to still be in school, and we find evidence for that. We also find evidence that the, there is an improvement in the match with the partners. That is, they're more likely to match with younger men who are themselves more adverse to gender-based violence. Next, please. So in conclusion, you know, our results support the concern that is very present these days, that viral outbreaks um, hit women the hardest. Uh, this has implications, obviously, for equity, but also efficiency is at stake here, because the human capital of half the population in an entire generation basically drops. And this affects, as we saw, 
also the most talented. So it's not a matter of an effect at the margin that some girls drop out of school, but once schools are closed, everybody is vulnerable and susceptible to get pregnant and this ruins basically the, the human capital accumulation of every girl, regardless of their ability. Safe spaces seem to be a cheap and effective solution for this problem. They do not necessarily keep up the skill accumulation, but they kind of pause time and give girls a chance to be protected and go back to school when they have, when the schools reopen. And I'm done, thank you. Great, uh, thanks so much, Oriana, for your presentation. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I'll, and I'll invite all of our presenters to turn their video back on and, and kind of come back on the line and we'll open it up for a Q&A session. Um, I know we've received a number of questions using the Zoom feature, so we'll start um, asking some of those. But before we go into that, I wanted to just ask a question of my own, if that's okay. Um, so Michaela, Noam and Oriana, for all three of you actually. Um, now that we've kind of heard from, from the three of you on your different projects, um, I guess the question I have is, what would you say are kind of the one to two key insights that we as listeners can take away from your respective research um, around the mechanisms through which we can support children and youth in, in future crisis contexts? So, so what can we, what would be like the heavy hitting takeaways that we should walk away with as we think about um, another pandemic in the future, which hopefully won't happen or other types of like conflict or disaster settings? Um, so maybe we can ask you all to respond in the order that you presented in, starting with Michaela and then turning it over to Noam and Oriana. Um, and Oriana, one quick note is that um, the uh, sound is coming out a little bit glitchy. So if it's helpful to go off video uh, when you speak, if that's helpful, feel free to. Otherwise, it's always nice to see you. Um, so turning it over to Michaela. First. And change the connection and see if that makes a difference. That sounds great. Thanks. Michaela, over to you. I think like one key insight is that it's very important to act very fast when these uh, uh, pandemics start without like waiting long. And I think these are like, uh, is strongly related also to norm presentation. And what we find like without waiting for the inequality to get exacerbated, we needed to act uh, pretty uh, fast. And these are like uh, finding ways to provide the cheap solutions um, that has exploited the technology. I think like now going on in the future years, it will be even easier because people are getting more used to communicate uh, in an online setting or like through text message and like phone calls um, uh, through the education system. So these key component acting fast and uh, providing support using like these new technology is something that should be uh, uh, taken back from uh, our work. That's great. Thanks so much, Michaela. Noam, did you want to jump in? Sure, yeah, I would say acting fast. I totally agree. And I think that this, this crisis highlighted the power of evidence for us as an organization. It informed our decisions and it was, we otherwise felt like we were throwing the kitchen sink at, at what to do actually. We had very limited budgets. We needed to make some choices. So we needed rapid evidence. I think that was critical. Uh, and I think um, uh, sometimes we think evidence is slow um, but actually, there's nothing slow about randomizing. It's, it's just sort of the process of, of kind of writing a paper, but randomizing could be fast, actually, and give you a, a, a particular kind of result. So uh, I think um, that for, for us, actually, the harder part was collecting the data, not the randomizing, um, but you can do that nimbly and flexibly. The other thing I would say is I think technology has not really revolutionized education just yet. Uh, maybe others would disagree with me, but I don't think we've seen the revolution. But I think one of the takeaways for us has been, though it's revolutionized many sectors, um, meeting people where they are. They had phones. So I think often there's a sort of giving people a new technology rather than using one they already used to do something better. And then the final thing I would just say is demand. Actually, I didn't share the statistic, but 98% of people wanted to continue receiving these services, even when schools were to reopen. I've actually never seen that number in real life, 98%. And so I think, um, and this is some of the things, one of the things I like about economics actually is this focus on demand. I think sometimes in, in social impact work, we think about what will be good for people and not enough about demand. And I think seeing both actually happen together was, was really nice. Thanks so much, that's great. Oriana? Hi, uh, so I would say that the main takeaway is that, uh, you know, these, the effects of these policies can be really long lasting. 
you know, because of the pregnancies and most girls in uh, these environments are subject to the risk of teenage pregnancy, uh, the effects basically, it basically changes their lives. There's no going back. So it's important to look at effects that even short-term policies can result in very long-lasting effects. Thanks so much for sharing these insights. It's kind of helpful to think about um, these key points in terms of like the importance of demand, acting fast, rapid evidence, um, kind of the long lasting impacts of, of uh, these types of interventions, I think are all just important factors for us to keep in mind, just so that hopefully this won't happen again, but next time if it does happen, we kind of know top of mind um, some of those key lessons that we should uh, kind of keep in mind as moving forward. Um, our next question actually came through for Michaela, but I think this is actually relevant for everybody. Um, so Michaela, maybe you can kick things off um, again, if that's okay, and then we can kind of uh, rotate through the crew. But um, on the flip side, so, and I think all of you kind of touched on this to some degree, but it'd be really great to hear, um, since these studies were conducted during very unique times, so students weren't having in-person learning at all, there of course was like the mental toll of the pandemic, um, etc. What might be the broader applicability of the findings in, in normal times? So kind of what a pre-COVID context would have looked like? Yeah, this is a great question. And actually, we are moving in that direction because we want to understand whether these uh, uh, online tutoring is leading to the same result, even like outside uh, the uh, COVID time. So I don't have like a precise answer. So I would say like uh, you will just wait a few months and we will have first the evidence during like the follow up year. Uh, so during this academic year, we implemented it having like more uh, tutors, 800 uh, students were assigned to a tutor. Uh, and we will know like in a couple of months, like in one month, uh, whether this was like a, a effective in a case in which we had on and off uh, uh, in uh, back to school. During next academic year, hopefully we'll be fully back on school. The key aspect that we already know from like our follow up is that the demand was as high as it was like during the first COVID lockdown, both in terms of like volunteer university student. And this is something very important because people are usually worried that we will not get enough volunteers for like going ahead. We still had more volunteers compared to the number of people we could actually train and support uh, through this intervention. And, um, and clearly in terms of like schools, there was like an extremely high demand. Uh, so keeping in mind that, I really think that there would be space for this type of intervention going ahead. That's great. Um, Oriana, did you want to jump in or no? I just wanted to add that the theme of demand is very important. Clearly, you know, the kids want to go to school. They want to continue accumulating human capital. In all three interventions, we saw a very, very high level of demand. So it's not going to be difficult to help them because they really want to be helped. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Noam? Yeah, um, I would just say also we're actually, so these replication trials have happened. They've now, they're now reaching um, the ones that we launched post the Botswana study, uh, 20,000 people and it's, it's growing and it's a, quite a mix actually. So in some settings schools have reopened, uh, in some they were still closed. So we'll actually see what, which of these insights are persisting uh, in that dynamic. So stay tuned is what I would say, but I think a lot of these actually uh, are, are actually, and we're seeing already, I don't wanna, uh, we'll share the results as they come out, but it's looking like it's actually persisting, which is actually quite a surprise, but, but maybe it makes sense actually when one thinks about it. So um, I think we're seeing it actually wasn't unique to the school closure uh, and that these approaches are, are still working. And one analogy that we started to think about, uh, we actually have programs in health as well, and you know, if, if you were going to go see a doctor and it was going to be like 30 of you seeing one doctor at once, could you imagine what that would be like? And they're trying to diagnose you and support you and you give you, you know, give you prescribe all these things. But we do that at education, right? We have 30 kids in a classroom and we want we want the teacher to serve everyone at once. So one interesting thing has been uh, this this phone call provides a cheap and easy way to reach people. You know, it's short. It's 20 minutes a week. So it's like a doctor consult, right? It's not a eight hour day thing per person. Uh, but it just gotten us thinking in that way, actually, this one on one contact is very efficient, extremely efficient, perhaps way more efficient than the 30 person classroom. So that's something that we actually have never thought about in terms of our programming that we're now thinking about whether that can can replicate. 
That's great. Thank you all so much. It's it's great to hear that a lot of these lessons can be and will be and, and clearly are applicable even in kind of normal times as we think about COVID winding down and, and going back to somewhat how things used to be. Um, so a question for Michaela that's come through is that um, it's been you know really interesting to hear about your research in a high income setting like Italy. Um, and I know you had mentioned a bit about your ongoing pilot in the Dominican Republic. Um, so we'd love to hear a bit about the type of policy influence or, or kind of scale up potential that your study has demonstrated um, both in Italy and even outside of Italy and just more kind of detail on the Dominican Republic pilot as well. Um, so actually, uh, as soon as we uh, got the result out, we got contacted by a lot of different uh, um, organization, uh, um, like uh, some were NGOs, uh, some like connected with government that were interested in like scaling this up. Uh, and now we, we started with like a pilot in the Dominican Republic, uh, thanks to JPAL uh, Latin America. Um, uh, and we are already starting like to think about uh, uh, another pilot in Uruguay starting, starting in August. So there are like several countries that actually reached out uh, to us because they thought that this type of intervention was closely aligned uh, with something like feasible and something that would benefit uh, their, uh, their students. So I really think that there is a potential for scale up. Clearly, there are like uh, key differences uh, across countries, and we want to be considerate of that. So this is why, like, we will move step by step first with like some pilot, uh, and then like thinking about like scaling up uh, across those countries. In the Dominican Republic, is moving pretty well. So we have almost uh, 450 students that are currently uh, enrolled in the in the pilot study, um, and we are like we we haven't even started. We are still at uh, the recruitment phase, uh, but is uh, is looking. Uh, pretty well and it doesn't seem to be at least according to our team uh, that the uh, technology will be uh, an impossible barrier i still want to see the data uh, and again stay tuned and like in a few months we will get back to see whether like this will be actually fully implementable uh, with the technology available uh, but we are kind of optimistic about that yeah, that's great. I think we're all very excited to kind of stay tuned in and see how it, it pans out, but really exciting to hear about these plans. Um, congratulations. Uh, Noam, a question for you is, um, what were teachers doing during school closures? Um, could teacher knowledge of student needs be better used to target instruction or improve motivation? Yeah, absolutely. So I think so. there's actually data on this, I think in many countries from the World Bank and UIS on what teachers were doing during the school closure. And unfortunately, it's actually very um, spotty. And so in some countries, I actually think in Latin America, it's been more active, but in many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, very few teachers have actually been that engaged uh, directly. So often kids were given some paper materials and then it was actually quite an ad hoc approach. Uh, TV programs were launched, radio programs were launched, it wasn't clear how often people were tuning in. We found in our data only 20% of people were tuning in actually. Uh, interestingly, I didn't share this result, but these programs actually doubled listenership to radio and TV. So they actually have that knock-on effect actually, which is interesting. Um, and so one idea would be, how do you maximize that response to TV and radio, which we're actually now testing in these replication trials worldwide. Um, but uh, teachers have not been that engaged actually. So even in the study in Nepal, I think less than 25% of teachers have been directly in contact with their students in Botswana, it was also very low. So it seems like there's real potential to activate this. Teachers wanna be involved actually, they just weren't sure how. They didn't know if they couldn't go to the house, You know, they didn't know quite what to do. They said, okay, tune into TV. So saying, oh, you can just call the students and that's the way of reaching out to them was a real breakthrough and it, it wasn't actually a common messaging. So there seems like there's a real margin there to activate actually. Uh, and, and so that, that's what, it, it, unfortunately, there's a margin there, but now let's activate it, given that there is a margin there. That's great. Thanks so much, Noam. Um, Oriana, a question for you um, coming from our JPAL Africa team, I believe, is um, JPAL Africa is supporting the design of an evidence based life skills intervention in northern Nigeria, aiming mainly to increase enrollment. Um, and they suspect that early pregnancies due to early marriage are a significant barrier to enrollment. Um, they're wondering if you think that life skills programs that have time use effects could also impact pregnancies that are due to early marriage rather than transactional sex. So I think the main principle is that you give them something else to do with their time. And if it's attractive enough, they can, uh, of course, do that instead of hanging out with men, uh, older men typically. 
Now, uh, in our, uh, the evidence from Sierra Leone suggests that there was a strong demand for this alternative use of time. I don't know whether after they've been married, these would be equally effective because at that point, I don't know the setting in Northern Nigeria, how free they would be to choose what to do with their time. But if it's implemented early enough, so the clubs are designed for girls as young as 12, if it's implemented early enough, maybe it can delay the marriage and it can delay pregnancies. Certainly not for everybody, but at the margin, I think by providing an alternative use of time will at least have an impact on those girls who would like not to be married off at such young age. Yeah, that's that's certainly a helpful point. Thank you. Um, kind of continuing on this theme of, of implementation of some of these programs. Uh, no, Noam, turning it back to you, um, can you tell us a bit about some of the key challenges that you and your project team encountered when implementing the low tech program in Botswana and, and how did you and your team address those challenges? I want to say everything. Um, it was very challenging. Um, I would say one of the interesting ones which we were thinking about because our context was we had been delivering teaching at the right level before. So we were really thinking about how do you hyper target instruction? How do you know where the child is at and then make sure you kind of go to their next stage of learning? Um, that's very easy in person because you're viewing what the student knows and you're, you're very in touch on the phone that was harder. And so we were thinking about how to do that and at what frequency. And there's this great phrase, actually, I'll borrow this from Rukmini Banerjee at Pratham. It says, data often defies gravity. It goes up and never comes back down. And so I think that's true. It's sort of you, people enter data to their survey CTO or what have you, goes to headquarters. It's very hard to turn that around very quickly to help people inform their instruction. Uh, and so what we actually did is we ended up saying, don't submit this data. Don't submit this data, just use it. Ask this question, two plus two, and then use it. Don't, don't worry about HQ synthesizing it and sending it back to you. And that actually worked really, really well. Uh, and so in a way, actually, by decentralizing a lot of these principles around targeting instruction, um, eventually we got there. But it took time, actually. It took time. So actually, this has now followed on much more. So actually, in the first wave of our trial, we targeted instruction once or twice. But now, actually, as we followed on the work in Botswana, we do it every week. And so it's much more rapid. But it took us a while to get that. We didn't have a chance to test the hyper-targeted version. We did the kind of once-off targeted version. So that was very challenging, among many other things. Thanks so much, Noam. It's it's interesting to hear about this focus on like actual active data use and immediate response over like the long-winded process of analyzing the data and, and kind of taking away uh, some of the results, which tends to be quite long-winded, as we as we all know. Um, and then one final question um, on this implementation theme for Oriana is, um, going back to your study, what would you say were the main um, underlying conditions and mechanisms coming out of your Sierra Leone study that policymakers and implementers should focus on when trying to adapt the safe spaces intervention from the Ebola crisis uh, to the current COVID pandemic crisis? I, I think the main themes remain, pretty, they're very similar. There's closures of schools. I think I would focus on uh, uh, regions or villages where complementary, uh, or rather complementary to school substitute to the clubs are also short in supply. So in the, um, in the villages where there were no health center closures, the clubs didn't have this effect because the girls were used to go to the health centers. So <coughs> I think it's important to understand what the clubs are offering and what other substitutes exist for the offering. And you know, try to target places where such substitutes are not available. Great. Thanks so much, Oriana. Um, moving on to a few final questions in our last uh, you know, few minutes, um, more so related to kind of the results of your studies. Um, Michaela, a question for you is, do you have any information about why the majority of schools were located in the north of Italy? Um, is it because most of the schools that participated in the study are located in the north or does this have any implications for the internal and external validity, validity of the study? This is a great point. Actually, uh, we had a very um, short window of recruitment for our pilot study. 
And most of the COVID-19 cases at the beginning of the pandemic started from the north of the country. Uh, so there could be like one component of that. And indeed, we find a strong correlation between the number of COVID-19 cases and whether like uh, uh, the schools decided uh, in, in the province and whether the school decided to participate into the uh, project. So this could be one important component. And indeed, in the follow-up, we have like a much like a um, equal um, uh, coverage throughout the country with again like a, a slightly more uh, a higher number of schools from the north and this could be uh, due to like differences in terms of like a school uh, reaction to uh, these uh, um, interaction with a researcher so it could be that the schools in the north are more active and they just like respond more uh, quickly to our emails that was like the recruit recruitment method indeed in the future we are planning uh, to have like different recruitment methods that will increase the representativeness of the sample to other areas where the principles are not as responsive as uh, in schools, uh, in particular in Lombard, Lombard in the north, uh, where we got uh, most of the response rate. That's great. Thanks so much, Michaela, for shedding some light on potential reasons for kind of the focus on northern Italy. Um, we now have three minutes left, so I will uh, lump together two questions for Oriana, and then we'll go ahead and close. Um, so Oriana, for the work in Sierra Leone, um, did you collect any data on boys and whether Ebola had lasting effects on their education outcomes? Um, and then also, how did you gather data on monthly frequency of unprotected sex? Did the women freely provide this information? No, so unfortunately, we do not have data on boys at the same time as the, um, as the main intervention, but we do collect data on the partners of the girls when the girls are older in the, you know, three, four years after the epidemic. And then we find, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that there is an improvement in matching. That is, the girls who manage to delay pregnancy and continue going to school eventually, I mean, by, by the time it's 2019, everybody has a partner, the quality of that partner is better. They're more educated, they're younger, they're more against gender based violence. So okay. the other question was. Yeah, and then how did you gather data on the monthly frequency of unprotected sex? Did women freely provide this information? Yes, yes. we just asked. It wasn't culturally not particularly difficult to obtain that information. That, that certainly makes sense. Thanks so much. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining today's session. I think we'll go ahead and close here. Um, as a follow-up to today's webinar on addressing education challenges during COVID-19, um, we'll go ahead and share a recording of today's webinar, um, as well as some key takeaways from today's presentations. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. Huge thanks to our presenters for your time. Um, and please stay tuned for updates on the PP Initiative's future plans. Thanks so much, everyone.